when I hear about becoming a skills-based organization or being a skills-based organization, this is very much saying, I'm not going to hire you, Dart, because of your current job title. I'm not going to hire you, Dart, because of your PhD. It's starting to look beyond what has been traditionally leveraged, which is prior job titles, prior employer, any degrees or certs that you may have. I almost think about this as the shift from potential to impact. Like, what have you already done versus what might you be able to do based on a title or a degree? What are the skills and experiences that you actually have regardless of where you went to school and where you've worked before? Welcome to the Work for Humans podcast. This is Dart Lindsley. Talent marketplaces or opportunity marketplaces, whatever you want to call them, anyone who's been in HR for any amount of time has tried to implement a way for employees and work to find each other in creative ways that are beneficial to both. Some have been successful, but most have not. What makes the difference between success and failure? Heather Yurko is a seasoned talent strategist who's implemented talent marketplaces in two different Fortune 50 companies. She's provided them with platforms to source internal talent to solve business problems as they arise in real time. She holds an MA in organizational development from Columbia University Teachers College and has been building people, processes, and organizations for more than 20 years, working with companies like Cisco Systems, Facebook, and MasterCard. In this episode, Heather and I discuss the benefits of implementing internal marketplaces and how these marketplaces improve employee satisfaction and retention workplace sustainability in a post-pandemic world, the meaning of skills-based management, which is a very hot topic these days, the reliability of skills assessments in employees hiring, specialization versus generalization in the modern workforce, and much more. All right, as always, be sure to subscribe to Work for Humans wherever you listen to podcasts. And now I bring you Heather Yurko. Heather Yurko, welcome to Work for Humans. Thank you. It's fantastic to have you on the show. Years ago, we worked in the same building at Cisco Systems, and we were sort of in different cubes, and every so often we'd run into each other and just talk really fast, briefly, about what we were doing, but it was kind of parallel play. We were always doing something kind of adjacent, but not exactly the same thing. You're a deep practitioner in the field of talent, and in particular, for instance, uh, talent marketplaces and things like that. And so I want to get into the current state of that part of the business. And I want to talk about how is it evolving? How's it going? What's happening? You've worked a lot on workforce sustainability. What is that? It is one of those soup phrases, isn't it, Dart? It just feels like a phrase that gets thrown out there. So what I will speak to is just my own personal experience with it. When I start thinking about workforce sustainability, I really think about it in three different ways. It's really the sustainability around work itself, the workforce, the people, and the workplace. Workplace sustainability is probably what most people think of when they hear the phrase sustainability, which would be thinking about environmental impacts, right? So having buildings lead certified, maybe doing shutdowns at different times of the year to preserve energy. There's a lot of those kinds of things that people, I think, natively think about when you hear working and sustainability. It's usually more about the workplace itself. The two areas that I'd like to focus on a little bit more are the actual work and what does it mean to have sustainable work and a sustainable workforce. In both of those cases, what we're generally focused on is thinking about how are we creating work that keeps people in the workforce. And so a lot of what this may look like would be including well-being aspects into how we bring ourselves to work, ensuring that the work that we're doing is manageable, it's not overwhelming, ensuring that we are providing learning and development opportunities for people so that they can continue to grow and shift their careers as New technologies are being presented and made available to us as different business needs start to change, as you know, we have new generations coming into the workforce that have different needs in the way that they see work-life balance. So considering all of those things, the kind of work that we do, the environments that we're providing for people, and the type of work 
I think all kind of comes together into how we think about workforce and work sustainability over time. So the world of organizational psychology in particular has really always sort of broken into two big chunks. One chunk is how do we understand people's capabilities so that we can make them more productive? And the other big chunk is how do we make people productive without doing harm? And so some of these fall into that well-being aspects, you know, manageable workloads, things like that. How much do you look at thriving? So beyond do no harm into creating experiences that in which people flourish. In a best case scenario, I would say that is what we're trying to do. It's a balance of these things with talent marketplaces, right? We're trying to, from a business perspective, that's where you're going to focus on the productivity, right? How are we leveraging the people that we already have, the hidden talent, the hidden skills that exist in every organization and bringing them to the forefront to help us meet those business needs in a timely manner? It is so much easier to reach out to somebody inside your organization who knows your culture, knows your customers, knows how to get things done than it is to go try and hire an external consultant, bring them in. And then there's so much time spent trying to get them up to speed and help them understand. Whereas you could just reach out to your own employees and really be able to deliver value pretty quickly. So there's that aspect of it from a productivity perspective, which is, you know, of course, delighting our customers. But when we think about delighting our employees and giving people the ability to flourish, having a talent marketplace gives employees the ability to see other types of work. So they already have a job, they're already employed, but oftentimes people are looking for things that strike that spark of passion in them, that bring that joy, that feels like something meaningful that they really feel like makes a difference either to themselves and the world, you know, with various customers, et cetera. And so having different projects posted and allowing people to choose and to apply for these different shorter long-term projects, I think is a great way for people to flourish, right? It taps into some of those hidden skills and areas of interest that they have. And it also allows them to continue to use the skills and experience that they already have in new and different ways. So it absolutely feeds into that sustainability, right? You're allowing people to continue to grow. And you're giving them that opportunity to share that spark, you know, that maybe they don't get to share every day in their day-to-day jobs. I really want to get into talent marketplaces. And it's partially because you've had the opportunity to do this at two Fortune 50 companies. I mean, you've rolled out talent marketplaces. My first question is, has it been different? The first one that I did was a little over, it was about 15 years ago. And so this was homegrown. This was built internally, was not really leveraging anything like a large language model or, you know, built on what we consider to be modern AI. Clearly there were loads of, you know, matching algorithms involved, but it was just done in a very, very different way. At that time, there was a very specific business need that we had which was we were really divesting in different parts of the business, but we had incredibly talented, valuable employees that we didn't want to just let go. And we said, you know, there are all these new areas of growth that we are looking to go into. What if we could leverage the skills and expertise of those employees, maybe in some new and different ways? So that's when we really started to get into looking at fungible skill sets, right? Like who has skills and experiences that really could transfer, could translate maybe into some new and different areas. And so this was the first time that we had approached this. There was a lot of excitement around it in areas like program management, analytics, right? Like areas that everybody thinks of as being like highly fungible, right? Like those are skills, leadership, where you can move people around pretty easily. Where there was a lot of concern was in some deep technical expertise, where it was like, hey, are we really going to be able to move some of our real deep engineers into some new and different areas. And we did find that, yes, we were absolutely able to. I think we broke a couple of myths around that at that time. But that was really looking at jobs. So it was like, this is a full-time job. We're moving you know, a talent that we have out of roles and areas that we're divesting in into roles and areas that we're investing in. That was one of the, the bigger, I think, shifts for this one. So I want to dig into that one. And then let's talk about how the the new one is different. I was part of that. I was involved 
in that company's transformation, we can say it was Cisco Systems because it was a long time ago now. It was a company that was going through a very big transformation. It was moving from a very heavily hardware-oriented company to a very heavily software-oriented company. And it was also going from one kind of sales to another kind of sales, from sales into IT departments to sales into uh, the C-suite. And so these are enormous transformations. It's hard to overstate the challenge of transforming a sales force. Different relationships, different vocabularies, different cultures in an IT organization versus uh, the other, the rest of the C-suite. So I'm interested in the fact that you broke some myths because going from hardware to software, of course, it is, it is a set of different technical skills, but it's also a different identity. And when a company is transforming enough, it's not just what people can do. It's actually what they want to do. I've seen recruiters, for instance, in a downturn, moved into HR organizations and just die because that's not their identity. So let's talk about breaking some of those myths. Did you find that people could make that transformation? I think it's exactly to your point, Art, if they wanted to. And that was a lot of what we found was, you know, we tried to do a lot of upfront matching as people were going into conversations about areas of the business being divested in. They were going through limited restructures. And a lot of it was a conversation that was like, hey, this role, this department, this area is going away. However, here's a job offer. We really had a number of those. And I want to say, and forgive me because it has been a, a long time, but I think it was close to seven to 800 people that we went through that process with where it was, hey, you're losing your job and here's a new job, which was an incredible thing for people to consider. But again, not everybody decided that that was what they wanted, even if we thought the skills were really closely matched. So a lot of it does come down to that desire. Outside of that, with some of the engineering teams that I led, I had people who had been very, very dedicated to Oracle platforms and to being, you know, C engineers that ended up becoming scrum masters that took a whole different skill set because it was something that they were interested in and they could see how the experience that they had had and the way that they had thought and worked in the past could be applied. So I've seen some really radical transitions with people over the years, but to your point, a lot of it really does have to do with what they want to do and how far they want to push the skills and expertise they have and you know how they want to spend their time doing the work. I can put that number of 600 in context, which was that these were 10,000 person reductions in force. So, you know, these were large events and that's a large percentage of one of those. That's a pretty big chunk. I'm interested in the phrase talent marketplace. And the reason I, I am cautious about that phrase I'd like to see it as an opportunity marketplace as opposed to a talent marketplace. And this has to do with my management philosophy, which is I'd like to see this as us presenting opportunities and there being a marketplace for those opportunities as opposed to people being marketed. You call it a talent marketplace. Is there a reason why you call it that instead of an opportunity marketplace? What's really interesting, Dart, I'm sitting here like laughing to myself because um, I do not call it a talent marketplace. It's generally, that's what, that's what it's called in industry, right? So if you, if you go and search talent marketplace, it's usually like an internal talent marketplace or a talent marketplace inside of any organization. I would never refer to it as a talent marketplace for a number of reasons. Just the fact that we're talking about marketing people, to your point, I do not like that. Or we're like trading people. And it just like all of it feels very wrong and somewhat problematic. So to your point, I absolutely refer to it as an opportunity marketplace. And as our platform, it's a career development platform. Like that's really how I talk about it with people. And it's an opportunity marketplace for people who are posting opportunities. And so when we think about that, I think you are spot on as far as, you know, how do we talk about this with people? It really is an opportunity for you to grow and develop if you are out searching for opportunities. If you're posting opportunities, it's a way for you to find the talent that you're looking for. Or, and that could be either somebody to work with you on a given project, or it could be, hey, I want some guidance from somebody or some information in an area where maybe I'm not an expert. Yeah, which expertise finders as a component of this 
I think are a very powerful tool. I often sort of disparage skills-based matching efforts, but when it comes to having the ability to find experts when you need them, just for a half-hour call, I have found that to be incredibly powerful inside companies. You see it going all the way from moving jobs all the way down to expertise finding for a half-hour conversation or mentorship or, or any of those sort of levels of engagement. Absolutely. So some of the different opportunities that we offer right now um, are really connecting people either to mentors to those experts, and that could be for a half hour conversation, or it could be for a you know a six month engagement. I've had both happen for myself personally. There have been um, folks straight out of university that came into the organization that are doing um, consulting with clients on blockchain, and I was super curious just to hear what do we talk to them about? And so like, I can just find people, reach out to them and say, Hey, tell me about your, like, what do you do all day long? You know, what are the conversations that you have? So there's those kinds of engagements all the way to, you know, some, some relationships that I've had with folks where they've reached out and said, Hey, I'm really trying to figure out a new pathway for my career. Will you work with me over the next, you know, whatever. So, and in some cases it was six to eight months in helping them really shift and refine what it is that they wanted to do with their career because they were just at a crossroads. So it's it really has been a, a combination of those things. Definitely the, the short-term project work is out there. We're now offering opportunities to find and have access to all of the open roles that are available as well as to learning. And so part of what we do is we can recommend career paths to people based on the skills that they have. So we can say, hey, if you have these skills and expertise today, this is how close you are. You have eight out of 10 skills for these particular roles, which could be the next step in your career. And PS, here are some of the skills and expertise that you don't have listed. And here are some opportunities that we have that maybe could help you close the gap on those things. So it starts to become this holistic ecosystem that's not just about, like it could be about the short-term things, but it's not just about that. It's like, how can you take on a series of these opportunities that really can help you move in in maybe a new or different direction for your career. Now, when you are making a pitch internally for investment in an opportunity marketplace, is there a delta between how you pitch it and what your objective is? And the reason I ask that is that you have to pitch it to the sources of funding. And the sources of funding are coming from a particular perspective about what the objective of the organization is. But because it is this brokering between people and opportunities, the objective may be closer to thriving work lives for people. And so I'm wondering if there is a delta between those two or if you found that you can be that you don't have to modify the pitch. It's an and, honestly, Dart. Like it's it's both. And so the conversations have been really around time to value for our customer base. And so there is a lot of conversation around that with the people who are writing the checks that, you know, they need to understand that there is an immediate value to this, right? That there's, we are able to provide something to our customers that is happening in a timely basis. We're meeting our business objectives in a new and different way. And so that absolutely is part of the conversation around talking about an opportunity marketplace the secondary and tertiary parts of it, and not that they're like less important, they're just different aspects of the benefits that you get. The secondary one is really around looking at our pulse scores, right? You get feedback from people pretty constantly and across almost every organization, every industry, that the reason that they leave is that they feel like they don't have any career development opportunities. And so being able to say, hey, here are some new ways for you to think about your career, here are some new ways for you to move forward, try out some different things, see what you like, see what you're interested in, see if there are other parts of the organization that can you know, take advantage of your skills and expertise. That's a fantastic thing. And then the third part is around sustainability, right? There is, I think, a number of organizations that are very interested in the well-being of the workforce and not having to have this constant revolving door of talent coming in and out of the organization. So how can we take advantage of the folks we already have and how can we invest in them for the long term? What's the biggest challenge in getting an opportunity marketplace to work? If you think about it truly like a marketplace, it's supply and demand. So you need to have a healthy supply of opportunities and ensuring that people fully understand 
why they would open a project. <laughs> why, like, why would I do this? Well, you know, what's the use case around it? So really helping people understand that, you know, you may not always have all of the talent that you need, all of the skills and expertise that you need inside of your own organization, but you probably have it somewhere in a large organization. So how can you tap into that? How can you find that? And so a lot of it was thinking about how do we educate people to, to learn that you, know, you don't have to be a people leader to open a project. I could be straight out of university and could be looking for somebody to help me put together a pitch on something. And who in the organization maybe has the right skills for data visualization or is great at putting together PowerPoints or good at comms or you know, maybe could guide me on presentation skills. So any of those other things, you know, thinking about how you take the work that needs to get done and break it down into those component tasks, break it down into the different skills and expertise that would be needed to really make something like that come to life. There's an art and a science to that. And so part of it is helping people understand, number one, the why, you know, why would I open a project? Part of it is, you know, very selfishly, I need to get this work done. The other part of it for some of our more senior people leaders is, hey, this is a great way for you to build skills inside this organization. Don't just assign things to the same people that you assign things to all the time. Really take this as an opportunity to democratize access to opportunity. Like get these things out there and let people apply, let people show you what they're capable of. And it gives them the ability to grow at the same time as well. Yeah, it's interesting. Andrew Chen wrote a book called Cold Start. And it was about how to get multi-sided businesses off the ground and how both sides need to come to the table to interact with each other. In Uber, the hard part was drivers, getting drivers to the table to provide those services. Once they were there reliably, everybody was ready to take a ride because a ride is a much smaller investment than actually picking up a whole new job. And so that was the cold start. And it sounds like the cold start in this case is not so hard around jobs harder with more like gig work inside the company. And I can certainly see that part of the challenge there is if I'm a manager and I'm going to take somebody on as a project, I need them to stay for the life of the project. I actually used the talent marketplace that you had created at Cisco and they didn't. And so I was very reluctant to go back. But mostly, honestly, I blamed myself for not being able to get them to stick because I wasn't able to keep them engaged in the project. But I can see that that's a tricky sort of level of this, there's a cold start problem there. But down at the expertise level, it probably gets easy again, which is if somebody just wants a half hour, it's a low risk thing. I can talk to anybody for half an hour. How has it changed? We were in a context where the company was taking a very serious right hand turn toward a new business model. How's your current job different? The way that the the problem has changed has really been around access to expertise and time to value. Like that has become the problem to solve. How do we partner in a way that we're providing solutions to customers very quickly? And so that is the aspect that I think has really become the impetus for why you would want to open different projects, right? If I, if I don't have all the expertise in my team, that's definitely one reason why I might want to try to find folks. The other, you know, I think pretty obvious one is just funding, right? We can't, we don't have all the money that we need to hire all the people we want or get every last consultant that would, you know, make our work go exactly the way that we, you know, envision it sometimes. And so being able to work with what we have in a way, I think is another really strong reason for us to be able to say, Hey, we, we know that we have incredible talent all over the world. Why aren't we tapping into this in a way that maybe we haven't thought about before? And I think that is one of the big fundamental changes was just the approach, right? Whereas last time the approach was like, hey, we're, we're going after jobs first and like shifting people in, in jobs. This one was very much we're shifting the concept of work, that it's not just about you get hired to do a job. It's now starting that path of you get hired because of the skills and expertise that you have. And all of the different things that you can do maybe become your job. It starts to get into a different kind of how we think about work. You were mentioning that you went to a conference and everybody was talking about skills-based management. Why now? What's going on in the marketplace? Why is that the conversation now? You know, I wish I had a succinct answer for why now. 
I do think because it feels like there's a shortage, right? There has been this ethos kind of out in in industry. I think for the last probably four years, there's a talent shortage that employees are the ones that are in charge, right? Because they're the ones that are, are getting to decide where they get to work. That has started to peel back a little bit over the last year, year and a half, where employers are feeling a little bit more bold, you know, as far as what wages they're going to offer and what benefits they're going to offer. So I think we're starting to get a little bit more of the balance again. But what we're seeing is, uh, I think, a lot of people saying, you know, I can't get the skills and expertise that I need. There's such strong competition, especially in, in technical spaces, that I think people are really starting to get creative on how do we share talent? And maybe that's even across organization. There have been some bold conversations around that that I've heard recently, too. I don't even know what it means. Like, I'm not even sure people who use the word know what it means when they say, oh, we need to do skills-based management. I don't really understand what that means. So maybe there's a range of meanings that we can discuss, but how are you hearing it? Absolutely. When I hear about becoming a skills-based organization or being a skills-based organization, this is very much saying, I'm not going to hire you, Dart, because of your current job title. I'm not going to hire you, Dart, because of your PhD. I'm not going to hire, right? It's like, it's starting to look beyond what has been traditionally leveraged, which is prior job titles, prior employer, any degrees or certs that you may have. So those things are great. And there's a whole other way to start thinking about this. I almost think about this as the shift from potential to impact. Like what have you already done versus what might you be able to do based on a title or a degree? Part of this is really tied in to some inclusive conversations, right? We want to go beyond just who has the ability and the funds to go to college and get a degree or who has the pedigree or knows the people that work at some of these big fancy companies. They could get that job because of their, you know, the network that they were born into. I think part of it is also that and saying, hey, we want to have something that is a level playing field, which is what are the skills and experiences that you actually have regardless of where you went to school and where you've worked before. I mean, there's certainly this true thing that a lot of the large labels that people can get are also filters. So I went to an Ivy League. That's a filter. I worked for Facebook. That's another filter. Because I worked for Facebook, I could go work for Apple. That's another filter. And you get this more and more sort of, well, it's lazy for one thing, which is if I'm a recruiter and I'm looking for somebody, I'm going to go, oh, let's see who's new from Facebook, right? Because I know that that's that that'll be an easy sale inside the company. Or I had one hiring manager who said, just find me more people from Caltech, would you? Because that was his alma mater. So the idea is that we can look past those big labels and we can see the true potential that people have based upon skills. And the impact, right? It's not just based on you know what we think they're going to be good at. We can actually test and assess, right? We can assess for skills on, you know, on some level. And you can talk about the validity of all the different tests, but there's some idea or some heuristic around being able to test for skills and expertise, whereas you can't test a degree. It's like you got the degree, great, but you know, what does that mean? What impact are you able to bring to the organization based on that? When you're working with HR departments and leaders, this is actually a follow-on question to how do you sell it to one side versus the other? But there is still this question of how do you wish HR leaders and C-suite thought differently about this problem space? What's interesting is that in my current experience, the business leaders get it. The business leaders absolutely get it because some of them have seen firsthand how they can access the talent that they need and create these massive dynamic project teams to get unfunded work that they want to have done done. That has been it's like, I don't need to sell that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they're experiencing that firsthand and they're saying, this is amazing. You know, there have been some incredible testimonials where people, you know, have leveraged talent that's hard to find and, you know, are hard to hire and really brought to bear some incredible insights on, you know, on some projects that really would never have seen the light of day without that. So that part is great. I would say I'm less concerned about overall C-suite, a little bit more concerned around how HR views it. 
because that is actually one, I've had more of a struggle inside of HR, understanding what, like, why, why are we doing this? And isn't this just, you know, like one more platform if we're just talking about it from a a career development perspective? So it's like, well, we have all these learning courses, we have all these other things. And so a lot of that really is around getting into more of the theory of adult learning, right? Like not everybody learns by sitting in a classroom. Some people learn by talking. Well, that, that, you know, that could be mentoring. Some people learn by, you know, doing things hands-on. Those are what some of the the short-term projects offer. And yes, there are still, you know, the ability to match to various courses and online videos and books and, you know, all those kinds of things as well. But that aspect of helping people understand that, yes, this is a great way to continue to grow and develop where the power really lies is in the data. And that is sort of the next phase of where I think a lot of these marketplaces are going to go is the information that you start to gather around the skills. And, and again, they're all self-reported, but you can, you can verify them through assessments. The skills and expertise that are being reported by people in the organization, as well as the skills and experiences that are now connected to your job architecture, that are connected into the job descriptions, being able to look at all of those things holistically. And again, if you come back to that first case, if you're doing a divestiture, wouldn't it be wonderful to understand, hey, in this particular set of job families or in this BU, here's all the skills and experiences that you have at a high level. And if we're divesting that, where else might we move this? Again, like on this macro level, you start to be able to have access to that kind of data. And this is something that historically, you know, we've not had access to things like that at that level before, or it would, you know, take a very, very long time to bring that kind of of information to bear on any kind of important decision making. So I think that's where we're going to evolve. How far have you seen it get? The integration of a common skills taxonomy across all of the different use cases. So there's the use cases you're describing, there's hiring, there's project allocation and finding and matching. There's expertise finding, there's career development, there's job profiles, there's all these different things, right? Which all of which could be, could share a common skills taxonomy. How far have you ever seen it get? This is the million dollar question, right? Like, can we get to one ontology that collects all the taxonomies? (laughs) Like, can we make this happen? And there are absolutely companies out there right now today working on this problem. That it's like, can you get inference around skills? Can you have this common thread that regardless of what you're pulling from, say, your LMS or your LXP and your HRIS and whatever else, you know, if you have a talent marketplace or an opportunity marketplace, like, can you bring all of this information, you know, your employees' resumes all together and start looking at this holistically? And there are a number of companies out there that are working on this right now today. I don't think anybody has gotten it fully nailed, but there are definitely companies like Tech Wolf and Gloat and Eightfold and Fuel 50 and Workday. And like people are absolutely working, you know, they're looking at this across the board and trying to make sure that there is this common set of understanding, regardless of where you're getting your data from. I think we could have said that 15 years ago too. It's a little bit like fusion. It's always 30 years away or it's always a few years away. I mean, it's a really, really hard problem. I personally feel like it's one of those treadmill problems for HR, which is there's this carrot and there's this treadmill and we can keep walking toward that carrot with the idea that, oh, if only I could get that carrot, which is this fully integrated thing based upon common terms. And where does the energy from the treadmill go? It largely goes to consulting companies who are selling treadmills. Where you can say it's good enough, right? That's the thing. Like, that's kind of the philosophy that I've tried to move us forward with, which is we're going to work with what we have. You know what? Like our job architecture might not be perfect. In fact, I know it's not. I know we have gaps in it, but we are going to move forward with what we have because that's what we have. And as we continue to shift and improve it, that's going to shift and improve the data that we have and then our ability to make, you know, more accurate, more appropriate matches and you do just kind of have to jump in with both feet at some point because you're absolutely right. Dar- like, otherwise you're just, it's always a, well, when we get this and when we do, and, when, and then you never do it. 
you have to start somewhere and then just say, Hey, we're, yes, we know it's not perfect, but you know, it is a step further than what we were before. We're going to continuously improve it. I think a satisfying answer is to say companies may want to essentially automate matching, for instance, but just getting close, just getting to the place where instead of a hundred thousand people you're looking at, you're looking at a thousand or a hundred people for that match, even just getting that close. Now, admittedly, that's what search has been for for a long time, which is that we take these big unstructured data sets and we use the unstructured data sets and we apply search against them. Search does all the work instead of the data being clean. And I will be interested to see if we do better than that with more structured data. So you are one of the leaders in service science. And so for people who have been listening to this show for a long time, we had Jim Sporer on the show, who's one of the founders of service science. And last week I had coffee with Paul Maglio, who's one of the other founders of service science. You've been really involved in it for a long time. And I, well, I asked Jim this question too, which is how do you define service science and how does it inform what you do? Yeah, I will say just up front, I'm, I will probably not be as eloquent as our friend Jim. He is one of my favorite people on the planet. But what I will say is I'll keep it very simple. When you think about centering humans in the work that you do or in the work that you're providing to other people, I think of that as service, right? So what is it that I am providing to somebody else? And in some cases, maybe somebody's paying for that. Maybe that's part of my job description, depending on what it is that I'm doing for my work. But when I think about how I bring that idea in to be in service of other people, the work that we are providing to others needs to center them. That I would say is like the simplest way for me to describe that. And so if I'm thinking about centering employees as a way of, you know, thinking about an opportunity marketplace, then what is it? What am I providing to them? What benefit are they going to get from that? And how do I ensure that it's meeting their needs? And so there has to be a whole series of continuous improvement of key performance indicators on that. How do I know if I'm providing them with, with what it is that they need on an ongoing basis? You know, and how do I make that better? So I think centering in that and saying this has to be human-centric design, I have to know who my audience is and who I'm designing this for, really becomes central to the services that I'm providing. And to think of everything like a service. It's not just that like, hey, this is a platform that I run. It's really, I'm providing a service to people that is allowing them to come and find ways to grow their careers. I think if I keep that at the center of my mind, I make different decisions about how the platform is designed, what kind of features and functionality we put on there. That is really how I've, I've tried to keep myself centered from a, a design and a, a service perspective when I think about service sciences. I think it's a fantastic description of it. You know why I like that description so much? It's because a lot of times when I think of service science, I think it, of it as sort of mathy, which is there's this exchange of value and we're going to see this extensive network of exchange of values and all of those exchanges need to be mutually beneficial. And so I start to see it as, an, as a graph or like a network, which it is. But the way you described it is, yes, it's about service. <laughs> It's not just connection, it's about human value, bridging between different actors. And then how do we focus on the human value that each of those interactions provides? Makes it feel much more human-centered to me than the way I've thought of it in the past. It reminds me a little bit of Fred Reichheld, who we had on the show, who was about customer loyalty and net promoter score and loving your customer. What he essentially did that I thought was so powerful is he took a look at businesses and he said, don't look at the money. Look at how everybody in this ecosystem should feel. Customers should feel loyalty to a brand. Companies should feel love toward customers. These are the feelings that we should have. It's interesting. It's like a different layer. You've led HR organizations in different Fortune 50 companies. They face different business problems. And so that's shaped what you've done. Like companies I've worked for could hire themselves out of any problem. <laughs> and then other companies I've worked for couldn't hire for a decade or something like that. In addition to the business contexts, is the culture of HR different? 
in those different places and how? Yeah, absolutely. Very different, quite honestly. Part of it is the product, right? What you do can often, I think, I have a whole philosophy around this, can influence the culture, right? So if you know, you're working at a company that maybe is very hardware based, right? This is based on things. There's a, there's a, there is a fundamental difference between like the culture of a hardware company versus a software company, for sure. The way that this can play out sometimes can be just around, I mean, from things as basic as the physical spaces that you're in, like how much physical technology do you have versus the lightness of like, hey, everything's an app and software and you really only have like one or two pieces of hardware that you're carrying around with you. The philosophy though, as far as being in HR and the differences that I've seen across the organizations for some of the companies that were more highly sophisticated technical software or hardware companies, there was a philosophy around hiring experts. Like you were going to hire the best of the best, the top of the top. And what came along with that is because it was a known known that like we hire experts and like we hire people that are you know the best at what they do. Everybody in organizations like that had a very deep respect for each other, regardless of what organization you were in. So it wasn't that like sales was smarter than engineering was smarter than HR was smart. Like there was none of that. It was just everybody here is an expert and we see this. And so everybody gets treated with respect. The flip side to that is there's far less internal movement in organizations like that, because you have this idea of like, you are an expert in a thing. And it's kind of rare to find people who are experts in multiple things. And so there's less of an idea of being like T-shaped or pie-shaped in kind of companies like that. It's more like you are I-shaped, like that's it. You're going to do a thing. Whereas in some of the other organizations, where it's like, hey, our philosophy is to like pay a you know seventy five percent of industry market. Like we're we're getting like great people. Some of them are experts. We invest where we need that very specific expertise, and everybody else is just like good, solid people that you know do their jobs well. What I found in those organizations is that there is far more movement. The philosophy is more around potential versus what have you done. Like there is still a bit of what have you done, but there is, you know, a little bit more around what could you do or where are you showing signs of potential? There's more willingness to invest and take risk in people and organizations like that. It really, it has been very, very different. Also working across different industries, right? Like being in in organizations that are tech and media and finance are, are all very, very different just as far as what's the ecosystem that you're working within. Levels of you know, concern around data privacy have been high in all of them and how that plays out you know, with people and, and what gets shared and what doesn't get shared also, I think, tends to, to shift inside the, the culture as well. You mentioned T-shaped employees. I've always associated that term with service science. Is it something that was coined by service science? I believe it came out of the University of Virginia. I could be really wrong about that turn. (laughs) So I'll need to check that out. But yeah, the idea of having this like depth of expertise in one area, but then also, you know, breadth across many different areas was something that I think was starting to emerge. If I'm, and I, I could have my history wrong, but I think it was like in the 60s and 70s that there started to be this concept of like, Having that breadth, like that's a little bit of where the the emphasis around liberal arts education really started to come from, right? It was like, hey, you need to know more than just this one thing. You need to understand how this one thing applies to the rest of the world. But there's not, I I still don't think there's tons of people that apply that in the way that they do their jobs, right? That they take on roles in multiple different industries or different organizations and think about, you know, how their skills might be used in different ways and then bringing that expertise and that empathy from the other parts of the business into the work that they're doing, you know, that day. I can see why service science picked it up, though, which is that I'm going to be a deep expert in what I do, but I need to be horizontal enough that I understand the services that the humans to the left and to the right of me need to be successful. I need to know enough about their business and probably about who they connect to, to be a a very effective, for lack of a better word, node in a service network. 
I can see why why service science was attracted to that. It becomes important, you know, for people thinking, you know, we get back to like the sustainable workforce. It's a critical thing to think about as well, that it's like, it's not, it's not enough anymore to have expertise in one area for your whole career, right? People now that are entering the workforce are most likely going to have four or five different kinds of careers by the time they retire. You know, we don't even have anything past being pie shaped, but (laughs) there's going to be, I think, (laughs) multiple different depths that people are going to have to have throughout their career. And so, you know, our ability to continue to invest in education and learning and continuous improvement and, you know, start hiring for neuroplasticity, I think becomes more and more critically important. Yes, you heard it here. Pie-shaped employees. That's that's a whole (laughs) new term. I like it. Are you involved with SHRM at all? I have been peripherally, but not very deeply for for many years, quite frankly. I bring it up because the Society of Human Resources Professionals, human resource professionals, is sort of the standard bearer for the dominant paradigm of HR. You've chosen, instead of going down that path, to spend a lot of time with people talking about service science, for instance, and publishing articles with them and book chapters and things like that. Why? It's such a great question, Dart. I think part of it is because of what's already known is known inside of of SHRM, right? Inside of of HR professional circles, I think there tends to be a lot of love for how things get done in a particular way, right? There are just certain philosophies around how you hire, around how you do performance management, around how learning happens. There's, I think, a lot of a lot of just like very staid, tried and true ways of, of how those things happen. And my interest has always been around how do we bring in technology? How do we bring in science? How do we bring in other ways of thinking about people and combining them in new and different ways that I think is appealing and puts us in a different place than maybe where we've been in the past. I feel the same way. I suspect I haven't given them a fair shake. And I think it's just because of not being a joiner in general and not loving received wisdom <laughs> in general. It's a weakness and a strength, I suppose. And for me, it's also coming from recruiting, you know, originally. And recruiters, there's, you know, there's a culture clash there between, between recruiters and, and HR and if you come out of recruiting into HR, you already have a bit of a feeling about SHRM that's hard to shake. <laughs> that's so, you know, I mean, you know that that is, that is also some of my path. That's hilarious. I had not really thought about that before, but yeah, that, that could be it. Like my background's in organizational psychology. And I think because there were more, and maybe that's really what it is, that there was more of a tendency for me to lean towards like psychometrics and analytics and research up front, like because that's my background. Yeah, that could be a, a large part of it. And just, you know, my love for engineers and engineering my whole life. I think it was those things combined have just kind of make me go, yeah, but it's not like, yes, the people and look at all this cool stuff over here that you can bring to the people, right? And and think about things in a in a different way. I think that really has been my interest in definitely in in you know in working with Isaac and Honestly, somebody who I've seen do this really well is uh, the Josh Burson organization. Like Burson has done a lot of, of fantastic research that is very much on a macro level that can bring in a lot of the more sciencey and statistical parts to the human aspect. And that is something that's just always been very appealing to me. You know, I've said my, my whole career has really sat at the intersection of people process, data, and tech. And the people is always first. But the rest of it is also, you know, equally important there. Now, I have argued that every time a person is represented in a system, they become less human. The argument goes that every person in a company is bigger than the whole company. They're more complicated. They're deeper. They're richer because humans just are. And yet we're going to try to manage them or help them by representing humans in systems that are going to have a resume's worth of data. At best, I'd like to ask if that, what you think about that, because you're, you're struggling on that boundary, you know, striving on that boundary as well. Yeah. How do you reduce a human down to 72 keywords? I mean, you can't, it's, it is less than a microscopic 
representation of who they are. So I think there are ways for us to leverage technology to help make things easier for people. There are ways for us to leverage process, maybe to make things a little bit more consistent, repeatable, expected for people. There's a way for us to leverage data to be able to make the right decisions. And again, maybe that influences some of the technology or some of the process for people, but you have to keep the people at the center of that. I have a good analogy for this. I might have to stop saying that quite so stridently as I have in the past, which is that a compass doesn't tell you very much about the world. It's a single dimensional measure of something. And yet, even though that's true, it helps you move around in that world. So it's possible to have technology that is oversimplifying what's going on and yet is useful in navigation. It's a tool. You need more than one. Not everything's a hammer, but it's true. Hopefully, you know, if we're designing it correctly, it's giving us at least a little bit more than what we had before, making things slightly better, right? As long as it's doing no harm. I'm very much of the do no, do no harm philosophy. <laughs> as long as it's not doing harm, hopefully it's a tool that we can leverage under the right circumstances. Now, I ask this question at the end of every show. What do you hire your job to do for you? Your job hires you to do something for it. What do you hire it to do for you? The job that I have right now, I have hired to fulfill me through helping others. It's very important to me is to help make connections to pay it forward for all of the people that have helped me move through this world in a useful way, in a a healthy and, and happy way. And so any job that I have has to give me the ability to do that for other people. And so the job that I have now allows me to do that. And I'll add, allows you to do that on the invention, on the inventive edge of things. So it's to help others, to pay your debts to others, to people who have helped you, and to dance on the edge of what's possible and new. It's based upon our conversation. What does your job cost you? It costs me time away from other hobbies. So the, the creativity that I get to express is often more often than not through my work versus other things that I would be doing outside of work, like making jewelry or cross stitching or doing other things like that. That is the cost. I like that you phrased it as other hobbies. This is my paid hobby. This is my paid hobby. (laughs) And it takes me away from some of my unpaid hobbies, but they're still all hobbies. I like that a lot. Where can people find you? Or learn more about you or your work or ICIP, which is the International Society of Service Innovation Professionals, just because we've said ICIP a couple of times. What are good places for people to go? People can find me on LinkedIn at HYERCO. That's the easiest way to find me on LinkedIn. And you can definitely learn more about ICIP at issip.org, O-R-G. Great information there just around service sciences in general. You can certainly, if you put Talent Marketplace in your favorite search engine, you will find all kinds of information around all the different opportunity marketplaces that are out there and what different organizations are doing. This is definitely a pretty strong movement. Same thing with you know becoming a skills-based organization. Lots of, of great, robust conversations being had right now. No one has the answers. No one has it figured out, but there are a lot of people trying to figure it out. So there are great groups and people that you can meet um, who are all on this journey together. Thank you very much for coming on the show today. Thanks so much for having me, Darren. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Work for Humans. If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a five-star rating wherever you listen to podcasts and share the show with one person you think would get value from it. Believe it or not, this really helps us grow the show and reach more people who want to build the kind of work that people really want. As always, thank you to my producer, Jason Ames at Ninth Path Audio for his insights into content and his high standard for quality. Final note, the opinions shared here are my own and not the views of Google or Cisco Systems. Thanks again for listening. See you next time.